I went on uh, Saturday. Um, Huck and I went over to Dave and Sarah's house to, to play with Sam. And I'd seen something on Facebook, and I didn't make the connection that it was in their neighborhood. But as I drove in, I realized this is the annual garage sale in Hidden Hills. Uh, and have you ever had that experience of like, you, like you've been away from something long enough, or you've had enough distance, uh, or like it just hasn't really like tripped the trigger in a while, and then something happens, and you're like, oh my God, that's me. I have to deal with that. Uh, I come from a long line of garage sailors. Um, so I feel like <laughs> it's like a confession, like, hi, Ben. It's okay. Uh, yeah, no, my, my, uh, my dad can't, um, can't pass a garage sale. Uh, and so I grew up, my dad would stop, and his thing, like he has a problem, his thing is antique chairs, specifically. So for, I think, 20 or 25 years, my dad would pick up these like beaten down old rock maple, you know, he, these beautiful finds at a garage sale, and he would take them to his friend Maurice at the Wedgwood shop, and Maurice would refurbish them. And I grew up with dining tables surrounded by mismatched antique chairs. My dad would sell them and give them away, but he couldn't pass this up. Uh, and it f- infuriated my mom. She'd all, you know, they'd always be la- an hour late for something because my dad had to like hit a few garage sales. Uh, my, uncle, my uncle Gil has so many full sets of tools in toolboxes that he has, I think, two or three additional garages on his property to store full sets of tools that he doesn't need, that he'll never use. Just, he just cannot pass a garage sale and not get like, high-quality tools. Like The older, the better, like when they used to make them right. Uh, so that's, you know, that's my Uncle Gil. My, uh, my dad at one time bought a full-size wooden telephone pole at a garage sale. Uh, I still don't know how he transported it, but he bought it so that he could cut it up to make like stump-style seating for a, like a bonfire. Uh, so this is what I grew up with. And every, every so often, probably every few years, we would have a garage sale. And if you've had a garage sale, you know that you don't ever make any money. But it was a really interesting exercise for us as kids. And it was, uh, the process of it was really valuable because we'd clean out the garage, we'd clean out our closets, we'd clean out the back porch, and my parents would give each of us a full pack of the little red stickers. And we would have to go through our lives and put dollar values on things. And we'd have to start making decisions about the value of our stuff and what we were willing to get rid of and at what price and what we couldn't live without. And so even as a young kid, I remember sort of, coming to realize how important it was to have that sort of reflection, that it was cathartic, and that it was really uh, pretty meaningful. And so we're coming up, this month is the 500th anniversary of Clarence. No. <laughs> did, you, did you hit the thunder button again? Um, so this is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and so this fall, we're sort of working through this theme of reform uh, and how, especially the Christian tradition, is still reforming, still being reformed, and, and how the roots of tradition nurture innovation uh, in, the, in the church and the Christian tradition. And Phyllis Tickle um, is uh, a theologian and church historian who says uh, about every 500 years, the Christian tradition goes through a major shift in which it has a rummage sale, it cleans out the garage, it makes those decisions about what it can get rid of and what it can't live without, uh, and that we are now, at the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we're in the midst of another one of these sort of shakeups, and so that's kind of where we are this fall, and we're going to think tonight about uh, cleaning out the garage of the Bible. And I want to be really clear <laughs> that we're not selling out the Bible or selling off the Bible or getting rid of the Bible, uh, in the same way you don't have a garage sale to sell a garage, um, the issue is our relationship with the stuff that's in it, right? So if we hang on to the garage of the Bible, it's every so often really valuable for us to explore our relationship to it. Where are our values and connection with the Bible? What are the things we can't live without uh, and, and the things that we probably need to get rid of? Uh, Jim Cain sent me some interesting thoughts this week about sort of what the Bible is and the development of it that he pulled from uh, Marcus Borg's book, Reading the Bible Again for the First Time. He says, writers were not writing the Bible. No Bible existed. Writers were not writing what they saw and heard Jesus do. They weren't there. Writers were not writing to evangelize the world. Writers were writing about their faith community's understanding of Jesus and who he was. Writers were excited about their faith community and their understandings of Jesus. 
Different communities have different conceptions of Jesus. These books made it into the Bible, to Heather's point, because they meshed with the conceptions of the selection committee. Very often, powerful white men who had status in an empire. And in this entire quote, you could swap out the word God for Jesus, because this doesn't just pertain to the writing about Jesus, this pertains to the entire Bible. This is sort of how it came to be. Uh, and it's important for us to keep in mind when we're thinking about the Bible or reading it, uh, and we'll get into this more, that it does have, I think, over 40 or 45 authors, was developed over between 1,500 and 2,000 years, over three continents. Uh, so this is sort of how all this comes together. And we need to clean out the garage of the Bible, and it's, it's probably overdue, uh, because we've mishandled. Uh, we've mishandled this text in relationship to things like science and ethics and medicine uh, and evolution and technology. Um, in a lot of those cases, because the Bible doesn't have a lot of clear stuff to say about it, and so we sort of create frameworks and we say, the Bible says, when really it's like, we've decided this, and so we're going to figure out how to make the Bible say, you know, whatever we want, X, Y, or Z. We don't have to look far, and, and we saw this in the readings, uh, for examples of how from slavery to segregation to modern issues of, uh, of gay rights and the LGBTQ plus community. So I thought this was a really neat way of sort of uh, illustrating this quickly. This video is a, a colleague of mine, uh, the Reverend Dr. Phil Snyder, and he's speaking at uh, a commission meeting and they're discussing a piece of legislation that is going to discriminate against LGBTQ people uh, in the city of Springfield. And so he comes to speak at the city commission meeting and it's, it's really pretty neat what he does. Good evening. My name is the Reverend Dr. Phil Snyder. I was born and raised in Springfield, Missouri. And I stand before you this evening in support of this ordinance. I worry about the future of our city. Any accurate reading of the Bible should make it clear that gay rights goes against the plain truth of the word of God. As one preacher warns, man and overstepping the boundary lines God has drawn by making special rights for gays and lesbians has taken another step in the direction of inviting the judgment of God upon our land. This step of gay rights is but another stepping stone toward the immorality and lawlessness that will be characteristic of the last days. This ordinance represents a denial of all that we believe in and no one should force it on us. It's not that we don't care about homosexuals, but it's that our rights will be taken away. And unchristian views will be forced on us and our children, for we will be forced to go against our personal morals. Outside government agents are endeavoring to disturb God's established order. It is not in line with the Bible. Do not let people lead you astray. The liberals leading this movement do not believe the Bible any longer, but every good, substantial, Bible-believing, intelligent, orthodox Christian can read the Word of God and know what is happening is not of God. When you run into conflict with God's established order, you have trouble. You do not produce harmony. You produce destruction and trouble, and our city is in the greatest danger that it has ever been in in its history. The reason is that we have gotten away from the Bible of our forefathers. You see, the right of segregation, I'm sorry, hold on. The right of segregation is clearly established by the Holy Scriptures, both by precept and example. One minute. I'm sorry, I brought the wrong notes with me this evening. Uh, I've borrowed my argument from the wrong century. Uh, it turns out what I've been reading to you this whole time are direct quotes from white preachers from the 1950s and the 1960s, all in support of racial segregation. All I have done is simply take out the phrase racial integration and substituted it with the phrase gay rights. I guess the arguments I've been hearing around Springfield lately sounded so similar to these that I got them confused. I hope you will not make the same mistake. I hope you will stand on the right side of history. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I figured rather than trying to, to like do that myself, he did such a good job. He got YouTube famous on that one, and he should have. Uh, super, super sharp guy. Uh, but he, does, he, he sort of illustrates beautifully how we use the Bible in such a way that we look at what was, uh, you know, 
a fine interpretation, uh, and now we think of as horrific, uh, but at the same time is being used in the same exact way on another group of people. Uh, I was at this, this retreat this week, and one of my uh, colleagues, this was like a, a United Methodist retreat, one of my colleagues said, every year the United Methodist Church has a part of their annual conference where they set aside time to apologize and repent and ask for forgiveness for that year's atrocities. Um, the ways that they've like marginalized people or like not lived up to justice or whatever. And he sort of jokingly goes, oh Lord, in 20 years we'll be ready to repent for the way that we're treating gay people now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's this, uh, this interesting capacity to look back and go, man, that, that was so clearly wrong then. We can see it now, and at the same time to look around and go, oh, God, those same, those same arguments are being used in the same exact way still. How are we not learning this? And uh, last week, we talked about this. Well, not this. So that's uh, in the beginning, single point. Um, but by the end, we got to this. So this is what we described as the cosmic narrative uh, or a narrative of self-transcendence as opposed to, to some of the sort of simplistic, binary, dualistic Christian narratives. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the idea is that over the course of the story we find ourselves in, uh, there are clear movements to increasing complexity and depth and unity uh, and we talked also about, and this is a phrase from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, that it's not just that things are expanding. It's not just that they're getting bigger, but that things actually also seem to be getting qualitatively better. And he describes this as uh, the story contains a moral arc, a moral arc. Uh, and so not just bigger, but also qualitatively better. Um, and it's this same ability to look back and go, Slavery was bad. <laughs> Child sacrifice was bad. Uh, the Crusades were bad. Thank God we're not still doing that. Now it's a bit better, but LGBTQ rights, racism, environmental, like we can envision still, this may be better than that, but we can also envision a that that's even better than this. Um, so, so that's sort of a moral arc. And what I want to point to is the idea that the roots of the Christian tradition are in the Bible, but the roots of the Bible are in a story that's larger than the Bible, right? The Bible is something that occurs in the midst of a story that's bigger than it. Uh, which means that we have to, and several of you hit on this, which is brilliant, thank you, we have to reform uh, the predominant reading, especially in the last 500 years, uh, of treating the Bible as a constitution. Uh, and several of you said that because a constitution, you know, to Robert's point, is approached uh, by essentially quoting article and section and chapter and clause and subclause. And we've treated the Bible the same way, right? Where we quote testament and chapter and verse. Uh, and the problem with that approach is that very often when you're treating a document like a constitution, you're doing that predominantly to defend a binary position. Um, it's not a way of opening conversation. It's not a way of cultivating dialogue, it's a way of shutting it down. It's a way of saying, this is right, this is wrong. This is good, this is bad. This is the way it is, and this is not the way it is. Uh, and so for at least the last 500 years, and, and probably there's this interesting corollary between uh, education and reading, um, and, and the increase in the ability to treat the Bible this way, because the more people who have access to it, the more who can learn to read it uh, as a constitution. Um, and the binary story most often that's being defended when we read the Bible as a constitution is the story that we sort of talked about last week, which is uh, our tribe is better, our God is better, our way is better. You should all come join our tribe. Uh, and if not, then we'll kick your ass and we'll colonize you. And uh, because God loves you, right? And so we'll pray for you. Uh, this is a very binary way of reading the Bible that defends one position over and against another rather than sort of that expansive, self-transcending story that contains a moral arc that's drawing us forward, pushing us forward. Uh, so that binary reading of the text is not actually the Bible if we take it as a whole. What we find is self-transcendence, the same self-transcendence we saw in that bigger story. It's like a collection of stories about the human experience of becoming conscious of self-transcendence. This is sort of what we talked about in the conversation, is that those growing stages of consciousness 
can actually be seen over the course of the Bible, right? Everybody has to be circumcised. You don't all have to be circumcised. (laughs) Only clean people get to participate in the life of God. Well, wait, no, that's not actually true. Everybody can come in, right? So you see these sort of things happening. From violence to nonviolence, it's just broad themes. From exclusive to inclusive, from particularly rejecting to universally including, from indifference to compassion, from hostility to hospitality, from God as a person-like being, sort of Monty Python reaching down through the clouds, manipulating life events, to God as the ground of being, which is whatever word you want to use, the force, the spark, the spirit, God, love, is the force that's running through that larger narrative, the ground of being. Or we might say the Bible does not present a singular perspective, but captures the expanding, unfolding progress of the human experience and consciousness of God. This is the opposite of a changeless constitution, right? It is, by definition, transforming, transcending, evolving. Uh, and so just for an example of this, if I were to ask you, based on a, a you know, cursory reading of the Bible, what the Bible clearly says about how we should treat our enemies, if you start, you might find first Deuteronomy, destroy them utterly, show no mercy. Just reading the Bible. Right? Or the psalmist, joyously, joyously dash the heads of their infants against the rocks. Yeah, we're just reading the Bible, right? We're just doing what the Bible tells us. But then you get to Matthew 5, love your enemies. Well, hold on. You keep going. Romans, do good to them. First Peter, suffer for them as an example to them. Uh, and so you can't ask a question of the Bible. Because there are so many different perspectives. And you see those perspectives evolve over time. You see limited perspectives self-transcend and continue to move, to expand, to progress. It feels a lot more, if you take it in sort of that big picture, it feels a lot more like self-transcendence than it does like an airtight constitution. Because if you were thinking of a constitution, uh, you imagine a constitution that has Maybe a a passage that very clearly says uh, it's illegal and immoral uh, to murder. Whatever you do, don't murder. And then in the same document, it says one of the best things you can possibly do is murder. Uh, It doesn't work. That does not work in a constitution to have that kind of internal conflict. And yet, what we find over and over and over in the evolution of the development of the Bible over hundreds of years so many places, with many different authors, is those very internal inconsistencies. And so, what is it? And this is, uh, John stole this from me, but uh, just off the top of my head this afternoon, stories, poems, prophecy, history, fable, parable, letter, sermon, sage saying, quarrels, clothing, instructions, myths, theological arguments, legal injunctions, laws, medical advice, festival scrolls, narratives, erotica, it's in there, propaganda, dietary restrictions, angry rants, recipes, yeah, they're in there, Temple design layouts, apocalyptic literature. The list could go on and on. We could have done slide after slide after slide because there is such a collection of different kinds of literature, not just in the Bible, but within books in the Bible. They contain tons of different types of literature. And if you know anything about literature, you don't read all literature the same way. If I ask you to put together a piece of Ikea furniture for me and I give you a poem, it is not going to go well, (laughs) right? If I ask you to write a a piece of poetry to seduce someone and you give them Ikea instructions, it is not going to go well. (laughs) And yet, we for a long, long time have had this very flat constitutional one lens through which we try to read the entirety of the Bible. And like any other Bible, it's important to note that this is, uh, and several of you said it, this is curated by a group of people. So if you go across the street to the library there, I don't want to ruin anyone's day, all the books in the world are not there. (laughs) Somebody or a group of people had to select which books would be there to make available to the public. And in the same way, a medical library specializes in books that have to do with the medical community and a Shakespeare library to those that pertain to the Shakespeare Guild. Uh, One of my friends, Keegan, is uh, the theological librarian at Vanderbilt Divinity School. And so she selects books that have to do with their theological 
education program. Now, interestingly, she would be a horrible librarian if she selected and filled her library with books that all had the same perspective, right? If all she had was like the perspective of one tradition within the the Christian faith and one particular theological conviction within that tradition, and every book in that library supported that one perspective, she would be a failure as a librarian. Because her job is to present the fullness of all the different perspectives, not about the answers, but about the most important questions. Right? That's what a library does. It presents a plethora of different voices and different perspectives and different answers to a bunch of proposed questions. And that inconsistency actually points to a deeper unity. Right? Inconsistency in the Bible doesn't pull it apart. It's actually the thing that holds it together and makes it truly valuable and credible over time. These are the questions that this culture and this community have lived with for so long that we've agreed that these are the most important questions and we don't dare pretend to arrive at a single answer. And so we have this entire collection of books that present all sorts of different thoughts on those same handful of questions. And what does this do, even if we want to say, okay, so words like authority and inspiration How does this perspective change if we think of the Bible as a library as opposed to a constitution? What does an authoritative or an inspired constitution feel like compared to an authoritative or an inspired library? I mean, think about how a constitution is inspired. And I think a lot of people, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one because I have this vivid imagination, but for a long time, I thought that biblical inspiration meant that God was either like hand puppeting someone and actually like writing the words because God, like God's voice wrote the whole Bible. So God either like wrote it through a person or God was like whispering and people were actually just scribes and they're just writing word for word what God said. So if we view the Bible as this like singular airtight constitutional document where it's all come directly through from the, the mouth of God, that's sort of one way of understanding inspiration and authority. But on the flip side, how is a library inspired? Each of the individuals that contribute a book or a work to the library are inspired in their own way, right? And how is different literature inspired? Are the Psalms inspired in the same way that Levitical dietary laws are inspired? Like, we have to expand our understanding of of these, like, oversimplifications of these words. On top of which, if we want to say that the Bible is inspired, uh, we also have to allow for inspiration not just then, and authority not just then, but what is our responsibility now? And here's what I mean, because it's fine. If you want to still think of the Bible as authoritative and inspired, that's great. But if your only understanding of authority and inspiration have to do with when it was produced, it's inconsistent. Because apparently, from this video, we found that a bunch of people are reading an inspired Bible, but their interpretation of it leads them to believe that same-sex rights are against the Bible. I would say that's not an authoritative interpretation. That's not an inspired interpretation. And so at some level, we have to allow for the fact that there's responsibility not just on the back end, but on the front end. And if we want to abuse an inspired authoritative document that was produced way back when by interpreting it in ways that are not inspired, and that are not authoritative, what does that do with our understanding of what those words even mean? Because inspiration happens apparently through real people in real places at real times. People like us who are sitting in this room, people who produce books like the ones that are in the public library. It's a matter of interpretation. In the same way that we no longer believe that slavery is okay, And yet so many people were able to get away with slavery being an acceptable interpretation of the Bible not even 50, 60 years ago. We have some responsibility. Maybe I bear more responsibility because this is kind of my gig, but I think it's your responsibility as a community to also be the ones who check me. So if I get up and I say something that's inconsistent with our values and I try and use the Bible to defend it, it's your job to raise your hand and say, bullshit. That's not accurate. You may be able to point to Bible verses, but that's not it. Try again. Go back to the text. Pick a different text. That's the credibility, the checks and balances of community. And so uh, let's reform in this way. 
coming to hold the interpretation of the Bible to be of as much importance as the Bible itself. Uh, I know that's a big step, and that may feel like an overstep for some people, uh, but that just is what it is. Because at the end of the day, you can't just read the Bible. You're always reading it through the lens of someone else's interpretation, yours or somebody else. It always has to be interpreted, as we've seen in example after example. That raises some issues. Uh, Because there's a long history of interpretation and sort of how we do interpretation. And so there have been arguments for as long as there's been sacred text. Do we interpret based on first mention or last mention, right? The first time it shows up in the Bible, is that the one we go with? Or do we go with the most recent one because that's the most progressive? Some people say one, some the other. Do we go with New Testament being more important than the Old Testament because it's newer? And then people go, no, because the Old Testament sort of feeds the New Testament. The New Testament is dependent upon it. Does the Bible permit what it doesn't forbid, right? And so it doesn't talk about birth control or abortion or anything like that. So is that stuff all just permitted because it doesn't mention it? Or does the Bible forbid whatever it doesn't permit? And so basically everything's off limits unless we get a special mention that says it's okay. And some people go, well, you're making it too complicated. Just interpret scripture with scripture. That's fine, but do we use the psalmist bashing kids' heads against the rocks to interpret Matthew, love your enemies, or do we do it vice versa? Which scripture interprets which scripture? And so finally people go, well, you're making it too complicated. Just go with general themes. The general themes are more important than the specific verses, but there's a whole other school of thought that says, no, no, no. Those specific verses, those are God's words, and so you can't make the general more important. You have to make the specific more important than the general. My point is, uh, it's not simple. It's not super straightforward. There's a lot that goes into making interpretive choices once we've gotten what we think is a reliable translation of original languages and all that stuff. Uh, So to make it very simple for us, uh, and this I'm I'm stealing from uh, a guy named Trip Fuller. He's a great podcast called Homebrewed Christianity. Uh, And this is one of his, like he says this all the time. Uh, He says, God has to be at least as nice as Jesus is. (laughs) Um, which I think is a brilliant way of, of, right? So let's make this our reform. We're going to interpret the Bible through Jesus, not Jesus through the Bible. Uh, and, And meaning, in our reading of the Bible, we have to continue to arrive at a God who's at least as nice as Jesus. And so when we think about uh, the moral arc, when we think about the big sort of self-transcending, expanding narrative that we find ourselves in, It's okay for us, having read Jesus, having understood who Jesus is and what his value system is, to look back at the Old Testament and go, man, you know, we're not hating. People can never do any better than their best to understand and articulate God as they understand. And so these really violent pictures of God in the Old Testament are based on the fact that they lived in these violent tribal warring cultures. That's how they understood God. But given what we know about Jesus we're not going to then read that version of God into Jesus and go, oh, well, then Jesus must also be tribal and violent, warring and justifying. No, it's the other way around, right? People's consciousness of, of who God is has evolved over time, has progressed, has moved forward. And so we interpret the whole of the scripture through understanding of Jesus and not the other way around. And it goes forward also. As we get into the New Testament, Christianity has to be at least as nice as Jesus. And this creates problems because we have letters in the New Testament where we have Paul saying women can't speak in the assembly, right? And they can't uncover their heads. And we have people arguing that based on rituals, they have to be excluded from the community of faith. And so we have to read that the other way as well and go, well, hold on, that's not the way Jesus operates, right? Women are intricately involved in his movement. Everyone has a place at the table. Everybody's welcome. So using this as sort of a simple lens through which to begin our interpretation because our understanding is, and we see this over and over in in the life and the work and the ministry of Jesus, he becomes sort of the embodiment of this self-transcendence, especially in the way that he treats the text that he lives with. And so interpretation is incredibly important. Uh, There's a story of the Rabbi Hillel, And a Gentile comes to the rabbis and basically says, and this is very odd, this didn't happen much, I'll convert to Judaism if you can recite the whole of the Torah while I stand on one leg. Uh, And so he goes first to the rabbi Shemaim, and Shemaim says, 
no way, you're ridiculous, go away. But he goes to Hillel, and Hillel says, I'll do you one better. I'll recite the whole of the Torah while I stand on one leg. And so the Gentile standing there, Hillel stands on one leg, and he says, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole of the Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and study it. <laughs> right? And then he drops a mic or something. <laughs> Probably a scroll, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and we see this consistently, not just through the Hebrew tradition, but into the Christian tradition. This is the Rabbi Meir. Any interpretation of Scripture which leads to hatred or disdain or contempt of any people whatsoever is illegitimate. That's a healthy lens to operate with. How do we interpret the Bible? Like that. Like that. That's a good place to start. And then Augustine says essentially the same thing. We must not leave an interpretation of Scripture until we've found a compassionate interpretation of it. And so each week we come back to this table and there's always a call to remember. And part of what we're remembering is how we see embodied in the life of Jesus this huge narrative of self-transcendence, the sort of moral arc, not just of bigger, but of qualitatively better, of increased consciousness, uh, of, of what it means to be human, of God in the midst of humanity. But we also see this in the way that Jesus relates to his own tradition and the way he's always reforming his own tradition. And so in his teaching style, he uses this sort of rhetorical device over and over and over in which he says, you have heard it said, but I say. And so he's quoting their text to them, and then he's essentially saying, I interpret it differently. And in every case, it makes it more open, more inclusive, more inviting, and accessible. And he teaches in parables, right, in which he's saying, I'm going to tell you a story, there's not a specific meaning precisely so that you get invited into a conversation and you don't oversimplify, and you don't reduce, and you don't try and use a singular meaning in order to start to divide people again into us and them. You either have the right reading of it, or you don't. And he talks about the kingdom of God over and over and over, and the imagery that he uses is one of self-transcendence. It starts like a seed, it grows and gets bigger and bigger, it's like a bit of yeast and bread, and it rises and it grows. He continues to paint the picture of this sort of expanding and self-transcending way of being. And this is what he invites his friends to remember. When he gets together for the Passover, there were instructions in his Bible, in the Torah, about how the Passover was supposed to go. And he did that. But then he also took bread and he broke it. And he added to their understanding of the Passover, here's my body. And he added to their understanding of the Passover, here's my blood. Not rejecting the Passover, not rejecting the Seder meal, but expanding it, making it more open, more inclusive. He says, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, remember me. Remember me. As always, the invitation to this table is one that is open because it's set not just for us, but for all people. And so no one will ever be turned away. When you're ready, feel free to come and grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup.